Okay, Osama, ready? Yes. Okay, welcome to the PID webinar. Uh, we are now today turning to the court system of Pakistan, and I'll come to that why we are turning to it. PID has been engaging in a webinar, Odyssey of Learning, where we are trying to find out what do we know about Pakistan and how can, we, how can we collect the wisdom of Pakistanis together? So we've been trying to get some of the best and brightest. And today I'm very happy to say we've got two very good speakers, people who've done some substantial work. Dr. Osama Sadiq, who has not only done substantial work in law, including set up, setting up the law faculty in uh, uh, LUMS, but also has done a lot of work on um, law and economics in Pakistan, written a book about that too, and uh, um, is currently engaged in doing this work on case management, which he's going to present to us today. Mr. Vakas Mir has joined us before on competition uh, work. He's a well-known lawyer in Pakistan. He's done a lot of legal work, well-known Pakistani academic law um, person. So he's going to join us on this uh, with Vakar to educate us on what case law management is. I certainly don't know anything about it, so I'm happy to learn. Now, let me tell you, PID is an economic research institute. Many people ask, why are you even interested in, in law? Well, quite frankly, most of you who've been reading anything about economics will know that economics recognizes that without good institutions, we can go nowhere. We can have all the money in the world, we can borrow whatever we like, we can talk a great game, but it's institutions ultimately that determine economic performance and determine where we are going. And if you look at this chart here in front of you, you can see, for example, and the such charts are readily available. This is from the World Bank. There's lots of things that are available, which show you the importance of institutions. And as you are well aware, roughly about four or five Nobel Prize prizes have been won on this work, and the famous book of Asimoglu and Robinson on why nations fail. This, after about 400 pages of stories, they conclude that the only thing worth talking about is making good institutions. And we work through institutions in Pakistan. One institution that is very important, obviously, everybody knows, is law. Law is the major institution. In fact, law is the institution in a country. And how law is administered is the courts. So that's why we are very interested in that. PID has done a number of webinars, as we said. And one thing we've discovered is that policy inconsistency, poor policy development is everywhere. There is no research anywhere. The SATE mentality, the transactions costs are high everywhere. I mean, for example, today somebody called me and said, even to sell lawn, we, even to sell a piece of land now, you need an NOC. We need an NOC for almost anything. I think pretty soon we'll need an NOC to go to the bathroom. So we'll have to go to the government to get an NOC to do that too. Um, there are no markets anywhere. Markets are heavily overregulated. The law is an ass in this country. Law is a huge ass in this country. Energy problem is a governance problem, the legal problem. Cities are a legal problem. There are all kinds of laws that are conflicting and all over the place. Who's looking at this? So Pied wants to try and take a look at them. I know it's a tough task and I don't think we'll be able to do it, but let's see. Look at our weak institutions. We've already discussed democracy. We've already had a webinar on democracy. We've written on democracy. Our democracy is flawed and nobody wants to talk about it or discuss it. Our election laws, our tenure laws, our voting laws, our parliamentary procedures, these all need discussion, but hardly anybody does that. Our markets, we hardly have a market in Pakistan. Every market the government interferes in, we're just putting out a, um, an, a working paper on the footprint of the government and it's, it's huge, it's terrible. Merit, merit hardly prevails in Pakistan. We've looked at the civil service, we've looked at human resource, we've looked at edu education, we've looked at energy, we've looked at city management. All of them point to the fact that the law is not clear, inconsistent, incoherent, and highly over-regulatory, and the judiciary also doesn't know how to interpret it. So that's why we want to take up this subject. Um, this is another interesting perspective that I want to bring to you. For a long time, economists have been talking about it, that at least for 30 years now, that uh, maybe more, 40 years. Uh, Bommel's paper came out in 1990, I think, yeah, or 30, 80. Um, that as the rule of law declines, as law becomes confused, lawyers proliferate. And it's not a surprise that law in Pakistan is a leading profession these days. Everybody's becoming a lawyer. Reason being, hey, a lot of law to go through. 
huge number of cases in court. They get stuck there. Why? Because law keeps multiplying. And the best profession to go into, I tell all students, go, go, go to law. That's the best profession to go in because you'll be in court forever. And that's a good thing to do. We've also seen, for example, um, as the quality of institutions decline, the number of lawyers increase too. So that's a great thing for lawyers. Let the quality of institutions and the number of lawyers decrease, increase. Look at this, Poland and Ukraine. Poland, which has better institutions, has more engineers than lawyers. Ukraine, which has bad institutions, corruption, etc., has more lawyers than engineers. So that's an interesting fact that I want to put before you too. We, all are, aware, we are all aware of this 100-year-old case in Pakistan, which points to where we are going just now. So this is the background to this discussion, why I've almost begged Osama and Vakas to come and do this webinar. In the courts, we are worried about time, inconsistency, informed decisions, economic activity, rights, the technical ability of lawyers and judges to handle cases, which is very clear in the cases that we lost in arbitration, which despite going through our court system, we lost in arbitration. Something was wrong somewhere again. That's a subject of major research. These webinars we are doing to excite research, to get our students to get excited about research. So maybe that's one thing that will help. Well, all this is to bring you to this point. Pakistan, the education to, sorry, we cannot grow if our investment does not increase. Uh, investment to GDP ratio remains at 15% throughout our history and is declining. Now, if a law, court system, et cetera, doesn't increase, it improve, educate, investment will remain stunted and we will not grow. Our long-term growth already is declining, as I keep pointing out in every webinar. And we remain stuck here. The IMF is in control, the donors are in control, and we are just running from crisis to crisis in a craggy landscape. This is a number of fund programs that I want you to bear in mind. We are always in a fund program, and part of it is because we have no institutions and because we have this mess around us, and we are fluttering around trying to work our way through this mess. Just to remind you, I and sisters got it right. 1950, they told us that we will be on dollar crutches. That's Lyakat Ali on dollar crutches. There are two or three eight gentlemen telling us from behind, hey guys, we'll keep you on crutches forever. And that's what we are, where we are. We, are. we are there because of our institutional mess. And what I want Osama and Bakas to do is help us think our way through the judiciary. So with that, Osama, let me give the floor to you. Please go ahead, tell us what case law management is. How can we evaluate our judiciary? How can we make it investor friendly? Um, thank you very much, Nadeem, uh, for inviting me to this very uh, important and dynamic forum. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, problem was at my end. Go ahead, Osama. Go ahead. Problem was at my end. Sorry. Thanks uh, quickly once again for inviting me to this uh, important forum. Um, I guess the challenges by the court system and the judiciary is not something which can be discussed in one sitting. So what I will be focusing on now is something which is very rarely spoken about. Unfortunately, one tragedy of the discourse around the judiciary and the legal system in Pakistan is that 95% of the attention gets hijacked by meta constitutional high profile political cases in the Supreme Court. And, and there's hardly any conversation on what happens on an everyday basis in courts. Now, the way you've pitched this conversation, of course, you've highlighted uh, the fact that there are important, sensitive, high ramification economic transactions, which get adversely impacted by the fact that the courts don't function very well. But it's not just the economic transaction. There are issues of huge human right implication. There are all kinds of other social, sociological, and economic ramifications which the court system has. I am not going to repeat uh, the diagnosis. You've already diagnosed the problem or at least shown the manifestations of the problem. I'm going to just say, uh, first of all, at the very outset, having sort of looked at this system since 2004, that we are, it can easily be said that we are operating in the 21st century with the 19th century system. Uh, it is quite remarkable if you compare any other institution to the judiciary, because when you go and you look actually decision making takes place, how institutional memory is kept intact, uh, how team building is done, how data is used, what reliance there is on technology. Uh, there's a huge difference even within Pakistan. So comparing it to, let's say, other 
uh, institutions in the justice sector, like the police or the prosecution or the civil service, I would say that the judiciary is far behind. I'm often reminded of this story, and I've written about it as well, which I chanced upon, uh, about a 19th century traveler and consultant of sorts. So somebody, I guess, from our tribe, who in the 19th century was retained by the British government in Punjab in order to ride from one courtroom to the other on horseback and collect basic data on the functioning of the courts. His name was Colonel Sykes. And he did that for 16 years. He must have done something in the middle as well. But this guy was doing a time series analysis of court disposals, quality of judgments, and court efficiency. And Colonel Sykes is still ahead of the curve when it comes to looking at the system, which is quite tragic, considering how much money has been invested into the court system, how many Asian Development Bank loans and soft loans and grants have come this way. We are the largest borrowers on that score. So what is the case flow management system? The terminology itself was unknown to me five years ago. And like most initiatives uh, looking at law reform, it was unfortunately not indigenous. It was triggered by a European Union funding uh, funded project, uh, where at least our contribution was that we had flagged the case that we need to look at the internal administrative reforms of the courts. So I got familiar with the case flow management terminology. And what is case flow management? I mean, a lot of people think it's some very uh, enigmatic phenomenon. I would say that it is both an idea and a culture, and it is also a set of very specific prescriptions which seem to have worked all over the world. So, you know, you cannot take a cultural relativist excuse here because these things have worked from Philippines to Canada, whoever has tried it, and they face very similar kinds of issues. So the idea is essentially that the entire control of the pace of litigation should be with the court, with the judge. We know that in Pakistan, that is not true. The litigants and the lawyers have found myriad ways of, of uh, retarding progress, distracting issues, making sure that you cannot get to an outcome. So that is the larger idea. And, and the judge is supposed to do it through a whole set of mechanisms. How is it not just an idea, but also a culture? It is a culture because it is a slow and very consistent process of negotiation, which takes place under the leadership of the judiciary, where you speak to the bar, where you speak to other counterparts, and it may take three to four years for you to actually start fully implementing the system. But once you fully implement the system, there's a quantum leap when it comes to the benefits. And I've actually had the opportunity to teach extensively in East Asia and spoken to judiciaries from Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, who embarked on this journey eight to 10 years ago, and they've done wonders, especially compared to where they were before. And then the third sense of case flow management is that it is a set of very specific prescriptions, which are very commonsensical. In various ways, a lot of these things have been tried, but in a very piecemeal fashion, or they still exist, but they've become outdated and obsolete and nobody cares about them. You actually need them in a sequential way and you need to do it in a coordinated fashion and you need to do it um, consistently. So four years ago, when we approached the Lahore High Court with the idea that case flow management is something which the government and the judiciary has agreed to do, uh, the first question we got was, what is case flow management? Nobody seemed to be aware. So we explained all this, which I've just explained. And the answer was, oh, but we already do it. And so the next thing which we learned and which we did was that we actually collected a lot of very important data. We dug out 2000 representative case files from the south of Punjab. And we very, in a very minuscule and a very sort of uh, uh, granular fashion, we actually showed that your case flow management system or whatever you call it is completely bankrupt. Because if you look at the delays and if you look at the stage wise delays, it shows the system isn't working. So once you confront people with data in policy circles, I've noticed that it does have an impact. So that pushback worked, the term case flow management was adopted and we made some progress. But then the next labyrinth came and the next labyrinth was, but Osama Sahib and your colleagues, we already have a plethora of rules which look at it. You just haven't seen them. So then we started excavating that huge morass, which is the high court rules and orders and regulations and directives and notifications. There are 15 odd terms. Turns out they're not consolidated. They're not regularly upgraded. They're all over the place. Either the rules don't exist or they're not implemented 
or they are contradictory and paradoxical, or they have fallen out of fashion, or they have been repealed. So, you know, it's easier saying that, you know, five years ago, a particular chief justice uh, issued a notification, but that doesn't mean that every single judge knows that that exists or has access to it or has to act upon it. So we pointed this out and we said, look, this needs rationalization. So what you need is a new set of rules because much as we have over legislation and over rulemaking, this is one area where you really need to sit down, look at the situation on the ground, the contextual realities and establish a new set of rules which are looking at the international best practices and we can revive some of your existing rules. So they agreed to that mercifully. The next step was to look at the institutional capacity for implementation and that was another huge revelation because considering that this is an institution which is overseeing justice delivery in a province which is bigger than most countries in the world, uh, the number of staff, the quality of staff, the training of staff, the technology, the data which ought to be available in order to make decisions about how courts are going to be managed. And by that, I really mean for the judges at the top to have an idea that we have this many cases of this nature, and this is the optimal time frame in which they ought to be disposed while ensuring due process and quality of justice and ensuring optimal allocation of cases to judges is a sophisticated exercise. And the basic infrastructure for that or the ethos or the mindset was just simply not there. So in any event, we did what we could. And one achievement, I guess, is, and which a lot of people don't know, that a lot of these rules were then given to special committees appointed by the High Court on civil and criminal side. They took a year and a half. They actually came up with some rules. I'm not particularly happy with all of them, but at least it's a huge jump from an ethos where we were asked the question, what is case flow management? to we have the rules, to them drafting new rules. But the rules haven't been notified. The rules still haven't come into actualization. And one of the main reasons is that this entire discussion around the courts is so unnuanced. Justice delays, justice denied is the most that our, our eminent journalists even can manage that there's no external pressure. Of course, the entire trajectory of the judiciary is to become very opaque. Now, I have two colleagues here, John Lipton, who was the project lead when we worked on this case management program, and he knows exactly how we move from complete uh, <laughs> denial uh, to at least acknowledgement. And we also have Zafar Iqbal Kalanori, who's a, uh, who's a very sort of um, well-known lawyer who was part of one of the committees. And so other people also joined in and they actually came up with the rules. But this is where we stand today. I mean, I can And speak at length. I wanted to give you a brief introduction to what the concept is, what our interface has been with the local judicial leadership. And as it happens, once we did it in Punjab, KP also started looking at it. But it's hard, uh, much as they can learn so much from each other. When we were doing this work, I was actually approached by counterparts and policy people and academics in India, because believe it or not, the Indian court system in some ways is behind us. Uh, when it comes to this. But I'll pause here and, uh, or, or adduce whatever comments you would like to do. I can't hear you. You need to unmute. Thank you, Osama. Thank you. Uh, Osama, just briefly, what does case law management mean? And how, how can it get a case law move? because we have that created in our mindset justice. Now, they're not the same thing. Access to justice is an important thing. A lot of other have other mechanisms other than courts to also this. It doesn't mean that just because you have a cause, you necessarily end up in court. So what happens here is not only has the population increased, there's an infrastructure and all that. There's also a lot of litigation here. And that litigation is because a lot of areas are unregulated. And also because the system is misused, there's the coercive use of law. So there's a lot of frivolous litigation and things like that. But let me just go through the checklist because I think it's important for us now to get into the nitty gritty of things. So I would say that first component is that in a case flow management system, there's a lot of emphasis 
that there be pre-trial communication between the parties, right? Oftentimes parties end up in court because they're not mandated to speak to each other at an early stage. Sometimes a lot of the issues get resolved at that point in time. It's just the fact that since the court does not mandate them to talk to each other, there's a problem. The second thing is case scheduling and case allocation. So any post, uh, case flow management system will have mechanisms to make sure that the right case goes to the right judge and also that every judge has optimal workload. You can have all kinds of algorithms and systems and mechanisms to ensure that. A lot of time is wasted when the wrong case goes to the wrong judge or some judges are overburdened, others are not working at all. The third thing is a very stringent pre-trial and post-trial scrutiny. So I don't know the exact percentage, but a very small percentage of cases actually get thrown out in Pakistan for being frivolous or mischievous or being coercive. So you need much tighter gauges in order to do that. Number four, our judges hardly have any meaningful administrative support, right? So they try and do everything and they can't manage. And more often than not, they're not very good managers. So for a, for a lot of ministerial and administrative tasks, they actually need a much better administrative force to work. The fifth thing is what is called a pre-trial conference. Now, this is a very, very crucial part. So think of a trial. The idea here is that before a trial, a judge actually meets the counsel of both parties and tries to gauge how complicated and how contentious this case is. And that will actually depend on the number of parties involved, the number of documents involved, the nature of the case, uh, and the number of expected witnesses. And that at that pre-trial stage, the judges actually reach an understanding with the parties that this is a one-year case. You'll have 20 hearings you'll have 10 witnesses. And then that person will, those lawyers will be bound to that framework, right? But that framework, of course, you can have exceptions to the framework, but those are going to be truly exceptional because this kind of a process will be undertaken in all courts for all trials. It is a bit of extra time at the very start of a trial, but it is to make sure that you are now time and there's a very clear process which is demarcated for you. Uh, the other thing you de determine here is also what is the anticipated number of witnesses, because more often than not, the real delay in these cases takes place where the parties and the lawyers keep coming back, keep coming up with new documents, keep coming up with new witnesses, and that's done as a matter of routine. So in order to prevent that, you do this. The second thing is that it's not just the overall case management. You have to have what is called docket management. Every this docket has to be managed through case timetables, through court calendars, through docket management systems. There are lots of softwares out there. There are lots of ways of doing it. Right now, everything is up for negotiation. You go to a typical uh, judge's registrar's office. It will be like a mela, a carnival. People will be jumping over each other, negotiating what all is going on. You know, So that has to be streamlined. The eighth very important thing is to have case tracks. So you have a fast track. You have a regular track. You have a multi-track. Like anywhere in the world, policy considerations determine where the money which is invested in the court system should go. Every case is not equal. That is true for the entire world. We don't seem to understand it. So a high economics ramification case, a high human rights significant case may be much higher on the policy platform, has to be a fast track case. You have limited and finite resources. You have to apportion them. In some ways, we're also giving a signal to certain people that we're not throwing you out of court. Or so there are cases where you actually keep them out of court. You're saying, but you are last in line. If you want to still stand there and wait, it's up to you. We won't deprive you, but don't expect to have the same priority. The ninth thing I would say is that not only um, the, the, the entire concept of timelines, which we don't have right now, right? So you can have kiss cases going on for 16 years, really depends on your lawyer, the judge, how many times the judge gets transferred. So you have to have timelines for individual cases, which comes through the pre-trial conference system, which I spoke about. And you have timeline for uh, categories of cases, which I'm talking about case tracks. You also have to have timelines for the stages of the case. When we did our calculation and we looked at the, turns out that there are particular stages of criminal and civil cases which take the most time. So that means you need to focus on them. For example, in civil cases, there's something called service uh, delivery. You know, when you serve notice and things like that. An inordinate amount of time is wasted there, right? So you need to be able to get the data from the system and be able to look at it at a meta level to say, why is Shakargarh wasting on the average eight months on process serving? So you can actually get to that micro level. 
The other thing, the 10th thing is what I would call compulsory early settlement and arbitration. So what happens here is that people do forum shopping, they do all kinds of stuff, then they go to arbitration. We really need a more full-fledged ADR system. Some work was done on that, it has stopped. But really, maybe 25% of your cases at a very early stage should be going to ADR and early settlement. Um, I already mentioned the fact that the overall ethos is that the judge has to control the pace of litigation, but that's only possible if he can penalize delay. Now, there are all kinds of sociological institutional issues why he can't penalize, because the bar goes up in arms and things like that, but that has to be institutionalized. You miss the deadline, you miss the timeline, it has to be standardized penalization. There can be all kinds of um, uh, things which can be used in order to ensure that people stick to the target. Now, one very interesting thing, which we uh, discovered from the data, for example, was that a very high percentage of everyday hearings in a case, we categorized as hearings, which we called no progress hearings. Nothing happened. So the hearing gets counted, everybody comes, but somebody hasn't turned up or a file is missing or the judge is feeling unwell or somebody is having a wedding and nothing happens and it gets chalked down as a hearing. So one way to look at the progress of a case in a case for management would be how many progress hearings did you have? You know, the ones which matter, the others don't matter. The other thing which a judge's control is important vis-a-vis -vis control of evidence because a lot of things happen around evidence. So the judge has to have much greater control on adducing evidence and things like that. The last few things, first of all, the decentralization of functions. In our court system, everything vests with, stems from the chief justice. It's just humanly not possible for one person to do all this. More often than not, these people don't have the qualification to do it or the interest at times. And so judges committees is something which the Lahore High Court started, but a lot more needs to be done on that front. I can have a separate session just on data. And one of the things which we did in this report, which we produced, which I'm showing here and which we have provided a link for is that we actually showed what kind of very fundamental data collection and analysis exercises can be done, which can actually guide the judges at an operational and at a policy level. Because I can tell you that what's happening right now is shamefully short of that. Winding up, there's another program which we can have on training, how training fits into all that. We have a Punjab Judicial Academy uh, you cannot have a, a, a case flow management system driven by judges unless your standards, incentives, sanctions, and service rules are also upgraded to actually incentivize that. So one positive outcome of this report was that they had something called a unit system, which was a very perverse system in order to have whatever fundamental kind of case flow management they were doing. And they did away with that, but we're still not very clear whether there's a viable uh, a substitute. The next thing, and you will note how late in my presentation technology has come in, and I've done that for a reason. Technology is important, but very naively, a lot of people sometimes think that technology is the panacea, as if there's some kind of a software out there which is going to solve problems. It cannot happen unless you change, change these fundamental things on the ground. In a court system, you will ultimately have to have a centralized uh, case for management unit to monitor all this, which would be in touch with all the district courts, so there are a whole host of administrative things which need to be done. And as I said, enforcement of standards through striking powers, cost, unless orders. And finally, what I would say is that this is not a one-off silver bullet, two-week panacea. But it's also not, not a 20-year thing. You can actually have a huge impact, even if one year, if you get the fundamentals in place and you sequentially negotiate your way towards more and more sort of sophistication. But what you need is leadership and guidance, constant upgradation. One, I think, huge issue is that right now the judicial leadership takes these decisions, if at all they take them, in a completely insular environment. And they feel that being asked questions about this particular service delivery is somehow a violation of their independence. And this is a very unfortunate and misleading phenomenon because when it comes to the constitutional courts of the country and their constitutional role, there is a certain sanctity to their functions and we want them to be inviolable and independent. When it comes to the 99% of what they do in terms of resolving disputes, protecting human rights, enforcing economic contracts, uh, we need to ask serious questions as to what's going on. And they need to talk to their counterpart departments because if you look at criminal justice, it's a chain. If one link is missing, the entire chain is dysfunctional. That dialogue, unfortunately, has been incredibly hard to 
So the, there are institutional, cultural, and historical issues here, but I've also shared with you some very specific on the ground prescriptions, which I've seen work in Philippines. And Philippines is not a place where reform is easy, as you would know. Uh, in Thailand, I got asked this question three years ago that, uh, Professor Siddhi, could you tell us how we could further fine tune our case flow management system? I said, what's your success rate? What percentage of your cases are now, in your view, within the control of the judge? And they said 90%. So they are now dealing with the 10%. We are still dealing with the 100%. And that's the tragedy of it. And I'll stop there. You need to unmute, Nidhi. Uh, Thank you, Osama. What it seems to me, what you're bringing to the table, which is, seems to make eminent sense, that we have to bring in modern management into the court system. We have to bring in management system. We have to bring in a management professional cadre, just like hospitals, for example. Our doctors run hospitals and they run into a mess because you need hospital administrators to run hospitals on modern management systems, the logistics, the timing, the, 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 the delivery of service, the charging of it the various tracks that you said. So that's very, uh, that's, that makes sense to me at least, mm -hmm. but we've still got the old system of the registrar running the whole judiciary, chief justice managing it through, it, whole, whole, through his own office. I recently read a, a sort of history of the US Supreme Court and it's fascinating how they do things, how professionally they do things, how the cases are apportioned, not necessarily if the chief justice is whim, they have to be portioned in a certain way that makes it uh, incumbent that all judges will take a certain caseload. So, I mean, this makes sense. So let's turn to Vakas and I'll, I'll say, John and Zafar, you're free to come in whenever you like. Just help us unravel this, understand this. It's a complex subject, I must confess. I'm an economist, I can't understand it very well, but we will try. Vakas, uh, you being a practicing lawyer, you've got in your own firm, you participate in the court system. How does this lack of a modern case law management system affect your practice? And what, how will this, the system that, work, uh, that uh, Osama is proposing, that, uh, how will this affect your practice? Will it hinder it? Will it help it? Will you become more effective? Will you become less effective? Because I can see it. I've got a case lying in court for the last 20 years. So I can see it. It'll help me a lot. So what is your view on this? What is your take on this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sav, and uh, thank you, Sama, for that uh, uh, fantastically helpful introduction. Uh, well, uh, I'll uh, deal with the first question first as to, you know, how does the existing setup affect uh, lawyers like me and, you know, any lawyer who practices in uh, Pakistan or Punjab for that matter. Um, it makes life really difficult for, you know, uh, your clients as well as you know, us as lawyers, if we simply have no idea of the pace of litigation. Uh, I mean, there are simple inheritance disputes that I'm handling where, you know, it has been uh, eight years, nine years in one case, you know, uh, 12 years, uh, where they have just not been resolved just because uh, uh, the issues that Osama points out in his report uh, keep cropping up. Uh, and there's no... Um, you know, sketch because there's no uh, pre-action protocol, and then once the case begins, there's no case management or scheduling. Uh, whichever side has a benefit uh, to gain, you know, uh, by delaying the process, abuses the system uh, as much as it can. And there's very little that you can do. You can uh, move a complaint to, you know, the high court for, uh, you know, for its management and inspection team to take up the case, but. As a lawyer, your hands are also tied because you, the judge will eventually know that your side moved the application against him and you still have to appear before the same judge uh, and you don't want to annoy him. So, you know, there's only so much that you can do. Um, and obviously, I mean, when people are thinking of filing cases, it makes life very difficult for them also because we, we're not in a position to advise them as to how long it might take. Uh, or if they want to change lawyers at a particular point, thinking that, you know, their current lawyers are not being helpful or are not being able uh, to have a case resolved. So it makes all these very important decisions really difficult to draw because you simply don't have the, you know, correct amount of data or enough information to be able to make those decisions. 
um, and as Osama, you know, uh, wrote this uh, fantastic report, I was just thinking that nobody has any, at least I don't have any idea of the data that was used by, you know, the National Judicial Policy Making Committee before they decided that they're going to come up with these timetables. I mean, what was the data that they were looking at, if any data at all? Uh, so it's a general malaise that affects the entire system. And I think there's a lot to be gained uh, if we are to adopt, you know, the recommendations that Osama proposes uh, or this report proposes rather. Uh, there will obviously be strong pushback from the bar because there's an entire economy that hinges on delaying uh, proceedings. And, you know, when judges get transferred, since there's no timetable, you have a new judge and then he or she can be uh, bullied into uh, adopting a new timetable uh, based on how much you want to delay a case. So we only have, you know, things to gain by adopting the recommendations that have been laid down here. Uh, but the push will need to come from the judiciary. I think so far, uh, the only thing that the superior judiciary seems interested in is either making these rhetorical statements that we are giving the lower courts X number of months to decide cases, or they think that, you know, simply increasing the number of judges in the high court uh, or even in the lower court will somehow fix all the problems, which, as this report points out, uh, is an outdated solution that, you know, there's been studies in the United States, as mentioned in this report, that simply increasing the number of uh, judges or courtrooms is not going to help you uh, get rid of the backlog. Uh, so, yeah, currently things are very difficult. It also makes it unattractive for foreign clients to pick Pakistan as an arbitration venue you know, as a dispute resolution venue, when, whenever you have a foreign client who's entering into an agreement here, they always want to uh, put in dispute resolution clauses that ensure that disputes are not resolved in Pakistan. So that makes it unattractive also. If they have cases here, it's almost impossible to advise them on, on how long it might take. Uh, and it's difficult to advise local clients also uh, because people have a stake in abusing the system. Uh, as you said, your case lasting 20 years is just one of many uh, thousands, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, just end by saying that we only have, uh, you know, things to gain by adopting the recommendation and by changing things uh, for the better. Well, listen, I thank you, uh, because I still don't understand. The reason I asked you that question, it seems like a win-win reform. I, as a user of the court system, want some efficiency. I want some timeline when my case is going to be heard. I've gone to court a few times to listen to cases, and I'm surprised. that There's a crowded, packed courtroom with about 100 lawyers, maybe more, and each one goes to the, to the podium for about 30 seconds, maybe maximum two minutes. Case is over. I mean, that sounds bizarre to me. I mean, it, it, I don't think it happens anywhere else. So it's a win-win situation. So Osama, if it's a win-win situation, why don't the judges buy it? Why don't the lawyers buy it? The lawyers, as Vakas says, he'd be able to plan his work better. He'll be able to tell his clients some, uh, provide his clients with some closure. Cases won't linger on. Judges would be less stressed. What is holding it back? Is it just sheer inertia? Yes, it's to a great extent it is inertia, and we have to understand the milieu we are talking about. So, mm. Askarol or whatever the population and more of Punjab is, every judge, uh, you can imagine the number of cases he or she is hearing. They have administrative mm. responsibilities. I've spoken about case flow management in groups or individually to around 15 to 20 judges now over the last mm. five years. Some of them tasked with the task of actually doing something about it, some of them taking the lead some of them in committees which were asked to do something. I haven't come across anyone who's pushed back successfully. You know, either they agree immediately or they look at the data and they agree. Uh, but I think what happens is that they are overwhelmed or uninterested. So you have to understand who these people are, right? The sociology of the judiciary. Um, I'm sorry to say, but it is also a capacity issue. When we talk about data amongst each other, when we talk about administrative frameworks, it seems like very commonsensical stuff to us because we have experience of other institutions. A lot of the people who come into the judiciary have zero experience beyond the very sort of parochial walls of their litigation experience and then getting elevated. Uh, they get intimidated, even if you simplify these things. I'll tell you an honest story, and this is not meant to ridicule or in any way denigrate because I'm sure they're good at what they do. So I'm not saying that, they need help. Um, I've made multiple presentations uh, on this, you know, data heavy, qualitative information heavy, but one of my most successful uh, 
uh, presentations was a one was the one in which I had cartoons. So I explained mm -hmm. the very same concepts which I've explained to you in cartoons. They are stressed, they are overworked, they listen to me, their <coughs> eyes sparkle, but then who's going to do the work? Because next day they go to court, they don't have the staff. Now, part of the solution lies with them because if they, they converge and they say, look, our job becomes easier and also the institution is imploding uh, and we're not going to be able to manage it. And as Vakas very rightly pointed out, how many additional judges are you going to hire? First of all, there are huge supply side constraints because if you look at the public service exam, the number of people who actually just pass the exam is so abysmally low that you don't have any candidates for district courts and all that. There's a huge uh, paucity of good uh, names increasingly because of the quality of legal education and other area. Uh, so, you know, there are supply side constraints. How many judges will you hire? 50 more judges? You have millions upon millions of cases. So you have to make these reforms. So my, my so the, I think the three, three things which need to happen. First of all, I think there is zero external pressure on the judges to think about specific reforms. So it's rhetoric on their side, it's rhetoric on our side. Our research institutes, think tanks, universities have not really taken reform agendas in a more concrete form and pushed them. One of the failures I think of previous projects has been that the demand side of these projects has not been fully explored. If you have 20 seminars around it, like your seminar, and you have 15 op-eds and write-ups, every time I've written an op-ed, I've gotten phone calls from the court. If I write a book published by Cambridge, it doesn't have any impact, right? So we need to press those buttons which work. Secondly, they need to be doing this together with the government. There's no violation of independence there because the government can help. It has more experience. They can have data sharing systems. They can have communication systems. Uh, and they need to hire professional administrative staff through some kind of a competitive process because they're overburdened. So it's largely inertia. It's also, as Vakas is pointing out, this fear of pushback. But we'd given them a solution for that. We'd suggested a sequence of reforms whereby you don't ruffle too many feathers at the start and you don't take on too many people. Also, you identify constituencies within the bar. And I'm sure they're very big constituencies who actually want this reform. A lot of lawyers actually uh, complain about the system and they would actually gain from efficiency. So it may turn out that we can actually identify who the troublemakers are and then we negotiate in whatever way we can. But we need to get the luminaries in the profession, the opinion makers, the influencers on our side. And by and large, those people would also agree. So, but who's gonna build the cat? So as, as, as academics, as policy sort of consultants, uh, we actually went beyond what we had to do in the sense that we diagnosed, uh, we researched, we prescribed, and then we kept pushing. Please make the committees. We'll help the committees. We made the draft rules. We kept going back. Please issue a policy. But there comes a point where you need other custodians from society, mm -hmm. from the media, from, from, from your uh, trading and business community, right? Because they are the ones who have some leverage and they are the ones suffering the most. So, um, yeah, it's one of those uh, classical dilemmas. But isn't there a fundamental problem? Uh, I mean, for a start, I don't see any of this reform from what you pointed out. Pre-trial reform, basically, planning of the court system, planning of the, of the court case, um, thinking out the, 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 the cost of the court and adjudicated cost of adjudication and apportioning it amongst the cases, the stages of the trial, procuring witnesses at an earlier stage, at a right stage. And, you know, all these things, they, they all seem to be things that shouldn't bother anybody. Just as, as, as you said, it seems, I mean, now that you say it, not that I would have thought it up myself, but now that you say it, it seems, and this is what Socrates said a long time ago, a good idea is one that immediately uh, takes hold of your mind. So I can see that, yeah, I'm convinced, yeah, it'll work, it'll work very well. The question is, if it's so sensible and simple, um, and I don't see any reason why lawyers would feel that if there's a pre-trial negotiation, the whole case is settled then, and they collect their fee and go home. I mean, hey, they're happy, but there's no reason to go to a lengthy court case. So I think in, in all these things, I, I don't see where the opposition is. Where would the opposition come from? Yeah, and why is it? We didn't even get to the opposition stage because the opposition stage would have come if a lot of this stuff had actually been, uh, we would have started implementing it and the lawyers would have disagreed or they would have pushed back. We haven't quite gotten to that stage. Uh, but I'll give you one example of why the doing of it. You see, somebody still has to 
make sure that this thing gets implemented, uh, people get trained, the forms get issued, the amendments to the rules are actually notified. Now, would you believe it that since 2016 or earlier in 2015, since we started working on this, there have been as many as six chief justices of the Lahore High Court. So every time a new one comes, it's the story again. You know, I turn up, I haven't done that recently, but I turn up with my leather bag and I start my spiel, uh, feeling very much like one of those people you find on the buses uh, selling their merchandise. Uh, although it's not merchandise, I got paid for it long time back, but this is carrying on because this is life's work and you do this kind of work. But I think the problem is that uh, the critical mass to ensure, and, and the other big issue is institutional continuity. So what happens whenever a new chief justice comes in is that the entire key staff also gets changed. So the registrar gets changed, uh, all the other key people in the high court, a new team comes in. Sometimes you find, you know, you've worked very hard to win over people and they're willing to champion and they've understood the issue and lo and behold, they're gone. And that just is, is, is abysmal. That's the same at the high level. The other sort of contradictions also has been that at times I've come across high court leadership which say, oh, this is the Supreme Court and, you know, they, the Supreme Court has nothing to do with this. The high courts are the custodians of the delivery of justice in the provinces. They have the autonomy and the leeway to do this. To the extent that the Supreme Court can help, fine. But the Supreme Court and its uh, various sort of attached institutions like the Law and Justice Commission, the Federal Judicial Academy, is an altogether different discussion. Because a lot of confusion has also come from the fact that when Iftikhar Chaudhary was the Chief Justice and the National Judicial Policy came, you know, these simplistic notions, all civil cases in four months, all criminal cases in six months. Now that is, um, I guess, case flow management 101 for a population of 35, but not for a sophisticated, complicated, contested milieu. You need to put some thought into it. You need to perhaps have 17 categories of cases, 17 timelines, four tracks, so you can lead the horse to the cart, you know, it's the, it's the same, uh, uh, it's frustrating, but that's how it is. Hmm. John, can I come to you and ask you, how is it done in the rest of the world? Um, I mean, for example, here, what I notice also is that there is no buy-in for research in this country at all. Nobody wants research, period. And we think that research is a luxury good that we will somehow develop when we get to per capita income 60,000, which we'll never get to. So we'll never have research. So, but what Osama is telling me is that this system is based on a lot of research. Somebody has to think through as the case comes in, learning from experience, how are we going to manage this case? Each step is kind of based on experience and research and evidence and somebody understanding how it, it works. So how do you do it in, in the rest of the world? Um, Nadine Saab, first of all, um, let me thank you for, um, and Osama Siddiq, obviously, for uh, having me uh, in this uh, very, very interesting and necessary panel. Uh, I need to say, before I, I say anything further, that I am speaking in my capacity as uh, an individual person, John Lipton. Um, I uh, am uh, presently working for another EU-funded project, which is uh, based in Islamabad, and I'm speaking to you from Islamabad here. Um, so whatever, um, you know, issues that I may be raising, whatever ideas that I may be floating come from me and do not reflect in any way the position of the EU, right? This has to be made quite clear. Um, uh, Nadine Saab, before you turn to me uh, to inquire how uh, the rest of the world was actually um, handling the system, uh, I, I would like, if you, if you don't mind, I would like to, to reminisce for a few seconds and, and return back to a situation that I'm quite familiar with, which is the environment in which uh, Dr. Siddiq carried out his remarkable and unprecedented work on court and case flow management, which resulted in, in the, uh, the report that he showed us here on the screen. Because I do have one question for, for Osama. Um, at the time, we talked about the period of time 2015, 2018, I was in a privileged position to witness the efforts of, of Osama Siddiq. Um, I could, I attended practically every meeting that um, um, Osama convened in the High Court, or rather that, that the Chief Justice 
at the time uh, convened for the purposes of case management. And I have a very vivid recollection of that particular uh, presentation or summit that you made with cartoons. Um, a sign that we are dealing with a very serious issue here is that when I reviewed, Osama, your presentation beforehand, so the day before we went into the High Court, I was in stitches. It was so funny. Every cartoon addressed one specific problem in the overall court system. So I assumed that everybody would be, you know, cracking up when you made that presentation. What happened the next day is that everybody looked at your cartoons and the chief justice and further uh, justices who attended the meeting were dead serious because they actually identified with all of the, the issues that you so humorously you know, put into cartoons. Now, this um, particular meeting was one in a series of possibly 12 or 20 meetings that we had on the subject. So what happened, and this, was, this, is lead, this is leading up to my question, what happened at the time is that um, Osama has, and his team, uh, Osama has uh, collected and scrutinized and, and processed uh, over, I believe, 300 um, uh, case files to, um, to look at the court system in Punjab as, as a doctor would be looking at the patient. And, and Osama came up with a diagnosis. Fortunately, it was not an autopsy. So the patient was still alive, but barely so. Uh, Osama then uh, went on to, um, to draft a series of recommendations based on his findings. And Osama and further experts were in and out of the high court to, um, present these recommendations and to try to secure some, some buy-in from the High Court. And we were always welcome in the High Court, always. Uh, greeted with a smile and, and, uh, and tea and cookies. But at some point, um, I raised a question with the Chief Justice, um, Your Lordship, um, I believe that we are all literally on the same page, the pages that were drafted by Osama Siddiq, um, wouldn't it be advisable to set up a committee to um, review these uh, recommendations and to engage in a dialogue with the experts who actually drafted these recommendations so that the court might take ownership of these recommendations and process them further, enact them into, into rules? And um, the Chief Justice at the time said, well, uh, we are the committee. And I said, no, 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 no. We be I believe that you should set up a specific committee for the purpose of reviewing these rules. And um, just a funny bit to have my name in, in the process, although I had absolutely no part in drafting the magnificent work done by Osama Siddiq. Um, when I put my question to the Chief Justice, he said, well, John, we could name this committee the John Lipton Committee if you want to. And I said, your Lordship, uh, this is awfully kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. But I would rather you named it uh, the Rules Committee or something like that. Um, time passed and I became very anxious that uh, nothing would be happening. So one day, that is my only, I believe the only moment when I felt that I was being helpful in the overall process. Uh, I had a, a person call uh, with the Chief Justice and I said, your Lordship, uh, if, if you do not set up a committee at least uh, for the purposes that I have stated, this reform will never take place. A few days later, um, the project received a copy of, I believe, an administrative order that set up three committees for the purposes of the um, revision of the, the civil procedure code, revision of criminal rules, and the third one was about, I think, the, the library of the High Court. Um, the project was very grateful to the Chief Justice and it looked like it was all about to happen. I and colleagues attended every single meeting of the first uh, committee on the civil procedure reform. Um, Zafar Kalanuri was indeed one of the permanent members of that committee. And Osama, we did our utmost best 
to push your recommendations with, uh, I would say, a heavy stress on, on that pre-trial conference that was so important. Uh, we, were, we were listened to. I'm not sure we were heard. And uh, I will certainly concur with your conclusion that you stated earlier uh, in, in your presentation that, yes, um, the High Court did review your recommendations, but, and they took them into account, but they were not notified. Well, I, I believe that some of these recommendations finally made it to the, shall we say, the culture of the High Court, but um, I'm still unclear as to whether these recommendations were truly enacted. So, John, as I said, the rules were formulated, and Mr. Zafar Kalanori can update us a bit on that. Um, it took almost two years. Uh, we had actually drafted the rules, but they also did their own drafting. They looked at our version, and the rules are finally there. So I think that's a major achievement, uh, considering where we started. But the rules are still not in place. I mean, the system hasn't been unrolled as yet. So maybe we can get a quick word from uh, Mr. Zafar Kalanori as to how things are. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to chip in with a few things. First of all, as far as Mr. Osama is concerned, his report, I think it is beyond a report. It is like a Bible for my judicial system as far as case management is concerned. So we have been working together for the last 25 years now, and this report is just one of those things on which we have embarked upon to improve the system. Now, talking uh, from inside High Court now, I had a role on that also. I have been a member of three committees formed by Justice Mansoor Alisha. One was the Rules Committee under Section 122 of the Civil Procedure Code. Other was the ADR Committee. I was a member of that. And third was the High Court and Rules, High Court Rules and Orders Committee. Well, we did a lot of homework on that. And as a result of that, we introduced full fair flight court management and case management system by way of drafting these rules. And these rules not only talked about, you know, uh, implementation in a way where you don't have uh, our forms to fill in. We have to fill in forms as a plaintiff, as a defendant, as a case manager, the judge has to do it. We recommended a concept of administrative judge that until the case is ripe for hearing, when pre trial conference does take place, certain things are to be done on the administrative side because this is not neither judge's job nor lawyer's job, save that time. Then there is a mandatory referral to ADR system again, which we put in place in all 36 districts. We had a court annexed mediation system whereby 189 judges were trained and it was successfully working too. So good news is that we had the notification on all these recommendations in year 2017 by the interim government and a full court was held by rotation. These are only to be implemented by one signature of the Chief Justice alone. And in my system of things, Chief Justice is a very powerful guy. As per Article 203, these are the high courts who have got the supervisory control over the subordinate judiciary and not the Supreme Court. And if the Chief Justice doesn't see an eye to eye with you, he will set at naught everything which has been done by the previous Chief Justice. We are trying to reinvent wheel all the time, the way the politicians do. So the Chief Justices who followed, they didn't implement them. Uh, good news is that yesterday a full court of Lahore High Court was held and they have said from November onwards, these uh, case management uh, prescribing rules will be implemented. Secondly, the government of Punjab has done twofold amendments in these rules. 2017 and 2020. So we have a full-fledged, you know, rules or mandatory backing as far as case management system is concerned. But most important thing, which Mr. Osama pointed out again, and I couldn't agree more with that. You need to train judges on that. You need to train the, uh, you know, lawyers on that. Because after all, this is a new system. If you have no idea how you are you gonna work on that, we are used to. 1908 CPC and those rules. This is a new word. And use of IT has also to come into play now. And we have to make a coordinated effort. I see one more problem.
that all these stakeholders are never taken on board government is working somewhere else people for the from the academy are somewhere else the policy makers are somewhere else sitting and you know they don't coordinate with each other if there has to be a, there has to be a coordinated effort and if they don't do it and trainings is the most essential part you need to have a bench book you need to have training modules you need to train all these guys and these uh, you know judicial academies you are talking about you know what is the content of the uh, courses that they are offering they are not training judges on new phenomena at all and if, uh, you talk about from my side there is no institutional memory either you know then when, when the new chief justice comes in the whole set of things are changed and every thing goes down the drain so there is no consistency so these are our basic problem we have to look at it as a whole i can talk and talk on so many problem because i become pessimistic also because when you work with a chief justice and he does it all right the next man you know sets it all at not you get depressed also thank you so much but osama the, the, you know to, thank you to osama osama, osama he, he, i mean i understand the rules i can i can see where you're going and to me as sort of you know as an outsider and as a data person it makes a lot of sense that you manage the process of workflow and you break it into bits and pieces and see how you can make the workflow go, workflow go faster but there are two things that i need to raise one is the administrative requirements as you said there should now be uh, each judge needs a docket manager each um, system needs some analyst there has to be an overall system analyst at the back there has to be somebody doing mnd review of the whole system maybe something like pid or the judicial academy or something the uh, the related thing is that we've discussed often and perhaps you can talk about it too one thing that we don't have in this country even though we have an overabundance of lawyers we have no legal research more or less anywhere in the country i know your lums is a bit of it but no other law school has any research component at all so that's a problem but my main question is what kind of an admin input do we need and does the high court have that do they need to double their size do they need to treble their size but second related concept if we've got the colonial system where the high court chief justice has all the power and the registrar is all powerful you know how power works in our country power is consolidated too because that's what gives you benefits so do we need to dis disaggregate the power of these individuals too or, or is this system is the rules enough do we need more and finally somebody has to play change manager as zafar saab said somebody has to coordinate somebody has to uh, you know train etc so who's going to be the change manager in the system so that's the that's the most uh, that's the black swan you know we can't quite tell because uh, unfortunately since the system is so hinged on individuals and centrality of power they take on an overwhelming significance so one learned during the course of this to try and target people who could be change managers but at the same time not to put all your eggs in one basket and to look at mid career mid level judges as well who may support them and i must say that during the, all this engagement there were judges who stood head and shoulders above others in terms of taking things forward which is why we are where we are and as mr kalanwari also confirmed uh, considering that this was not even part of the parlance uh, and where john left off in terms of things were still looking at least we have the rules all the forms now we know exactly what to do but it will depend a lot on who does it now let me share a little uh, talking to a friend of mine who's an english judge and she is a fellow writer of fiction as well and but we also compare notes on these things and i told her that i'll be presenting on this and she was telling me how dismal the situation is because of covid because of brexit said and a lot of other things in terms of current british court resources uh for these kinds of things and therefore there are delays there are all kinds of frustrations my point being that this is a lifelong exercise this is not a one time intervention yes you need a maverick originally to put it in place and to steer it but then you really need to think about sustainable mechanisms whereby there is external and internal accountability as my friends pointed out other stakeholders have to be part of it this cannot just be a judiciary thing now in terms of data the good news is that there is some rudimentary data collection already taking place there's a mechanism whereby all the district courts send some fairly aggregated data and that used to be the basis of the rudimentary case flow management which took place earlier so we have something to build on the other good news is that some of the judges did 
somewhat increase the capacity of the internal staff dedicated to this kind of work, right? So, uh, because they do have an internal system of accountability of judges and whatever. So the data is not per se very complicated, right? So, I mean, how complicated can it get? If I can do it, it can't be that complicated. I'm not a data person, but I just sat down and I came up with 35 permutations and my colleagues came up and where I was at a loss, I spoke to a, a data guy, uh, you know, who's a friend. Um, you basically need to look at uh, a certain kinds of cases and look at the process of the law and start getting this aggregated data, which gives you a clearer picture of the overall and the phase wide time frame in order to monitor it. So it's not a lot of very sophisticated hiring as far as data collection and analysis is concerned, as long as somebody actually buys into that. And for that, we need to once again uh, avoid the fallacy of equating this very rudimentary but important work with thinking that we can get a software and do it. You can do all this fundamental work and then feed it into a software and that will help you. Uh, but that's the thing. As far as administrative staff is concerned, once again, the, the high court has scores of people and hundreds of people uh, and even the district courts who are already in administrative positions. They just need to be trained. There has been some training in the past through projects, but it has been patchy. It's not very complicated to tell all the uh, readers and the registrars how modern docket management takes place. It's not very complicated at all. And you can easily locally develop customized softwares to be able to do that. Computers are already much more uh, visible in your sort of working environment. Uh, we mostly use them to make uh, terrible PowerPoint presentations, but surely they can be used for so many other so I don't think, first of all, that uh, technologically or, or, or cerebrally, it's a very difficult step to take. Once some high court committee makes the decision that we are going to invest this percentage of the budget over the next year or so into building a cadre of people. And then I think keeping in mind any sort of sensitivity to confide confidentiality issues aside, because there's always this thing, it's court data, this and that, you know, I think they need to they need to get into partnerships. They could get into a partnership with you. They could get into a partnership with LUMS. There are a few people everywhere, but they're spread out who are interested in doing quantitative research. Over the last couple of years, I've been approached by, by quite a few Pakistanis, economists and other academics who want to look at the justice sector. It's a big issue. So one can easily put them in touch with people who will not violate confidentiality issues, but will help them build up these systems. There is just no substitute. You see, I looked around, I looked, as I told you, at East Asian countries. Everyone customizes things to a certain extent. Ultimately, this is not rocket science, but the 15 or 20 things you need to do are pretty much the same globally. So it's not as if we are reinventing the wheel. We need to do them. We can moan and groan and procrastinate. Uh, right now, we have a mess. There is no planning. What happens is, periodically, people get together and they have some kind of a specific order to delay to reduce delay or backlog, which is all cases older than 10 years should be disposed or all cases. And, and that did have an impact. It did clear the backlog. The problem is that disposal doesn't mean that the case has actually been decided. They can still be in disposal, but the judgment still has to be written. Uh, but you, you know, the problem is that right now we are proceeding blindly. It's like a ship in a storm uh, overseeing hundreds of millions of people's disputes. And, and you don't have any picture of the landscape and you don't have any disaggregated data. So I think we have the capacity even in Pakistan, we don't even need any external assistance anymore and we don't definitely require a lot of money. You have a Punjab Judicial Academy, a fully fledged Judicial Academy. We've been trying for years uh, to try and upgrade its own capacity. So I think the fault dear Brutus does not lie in our stars. <laughs> it lies in us, underlings. Yeah. But is there a demand for such, you know, I often find, for example, the planning commission tells us now and again, give us a study. Mm. So we give them a study. After that, silence. Yeah. Silence for a long time. Nobody looks at the study. Nobody reads it. The question is, ultimately, as I keep telling people, I worked in central banking. And in central banking, every day the banks close, there has to be a study of the banking balance sheet. And the next morning, the governor has to look at it and take some decision, at least look at it, even if he doesn't take any decisions. I mean, that's standard procedure. But do we have any such, can we have such procedure, for example, even if some team, let's say you set up a team that looks at this case law management system, which I think is absolutely important, critical, and yes, somebody should look at it. When I say there should be somebody looking at it, preparing 
summaries for the chief justice. Let's say that some chief justice should get at least a monthly summary or a weekly summary or something that, hey, this has happened, this has happened, these are the weaknesses. In our, I mean, a short report, let's say two, three page report with some charts. Would there be a demand for studying it and looking at it and trying to take some critical decisions on that basis? So, uh, yeah. So the demand can only be created either through negotiation whereby you identify people who actually have uh, the concern uh, for a legacy, concern for the institution at heart, or they're getting sick of the criticism they're getting because they're incredibly sensitive to adverse op-eds and they're very, very keen, some of them, to use contempt powers. So there is a sensitivity. There is also this recognition that the system is bursting at the seams. But that doesn't seem to be quite enough. So there seems to be also a need for external pressure, which is really discourses of this kind coming, becoming even more mainstream, maybe even coming on television. So somebody who does investigative journalism and says, as my colleagues have shared, that this project was in the offing and you adopted rules, why haven't they been implemented? Now, I've seen that work in other ways, right? So once the forensic science laboratory was set up in Punjab and the possibility of using DNA uh, was now available, there was still, and there is still a marked reluctance on part of certain prosecutors, even the police, and even judges in terms of using DNA evidence. But when you have a high profile case, this is something which has caught the people's imagination and even the journalists have understood it. And they'll start talking about why aren't you doing uh, a DNA analysis? Why isn't it being sent to the Punjab forensic? Because they know now that there is something which can have a breakthrough impact. We have to somehow figure out how to demonstrate that what we are proposing is actually going to have an impact where you're going to, let's say, halve the lives of cases in one year. Uh, the collective frustration, because I also do sociological surveys of litigants, not just do I work with, I put my academic hat on and I go and talk to litigants. And I can tell you that the frustration there is really, really scary. Uh, and that is the kind of thing which takes you towards lawlessness and things like that. Um, and the third thing is that I do know that the government has also been frustrated. I'm sure every institution has their frustrations because a lot of these institutions don't talk to each other uh, and they refuse to talk to each other. And that I tell you also creates a lot of extra litigation because if there is some kind of a meta dialogue, a lot of the times any new legislation which comes in will be more apparent from a policy perspective to judges because a lot of frivolous litigation takes place. People challenge it then uh, you know, additional secretaries and chief secretaries are hauled to court. There's this entire you know, uh, uh, drama. And, and a so you would know that a lot of the litigation which actually takes place, a big percentage of that is government-related litigation. Mm -hmm. So there are ways where greater communication can actually reduce that. But the, the, the million dollar question is, how do you demonstrate further something which is demonstrably clear to us, to people who are ultimately in power to make the change? but we can't twist their arm. So if they don't do it, uh, the excuse is normally, oh, I didn't realize this work had been done. Oh, I have too much on my plate, you know. So I can give you individual responses, but not on air. No, no, you're absolutely correct. The crisis management is in our DNA. Oh, I was so busy, I couldn't pay attention or whatever, that's fine. But let me lastly ask you before I go to the floor, uh, I'm trying, one of the things that you know, I'm trying very hard is for students to take up subjects like this and begin to research them, because that's another way of creating that external pressure. And for students to understand this and take it back to their headquarters, you know, their towns and push the small courts to do it. How can we get data so that students can do, you know, repeat some of your work, extend it, move forward? How can we get such data? So data, I'll tell you, uh, um, uh, is an issue, not an insurmountable issue, but let me lay out the field first. So the data, First of all, you see a lot of the stuff is not digitized. They're now digitizing files and moving towards that, which is also an essential step that you should have everything digitized. I mean, the advantages are obvious. If you go to the, by the way, one day I'll take you to the high court's uh, archives or the storage room. It's a site to be seen. It's like uh, Aladdin's cave, right? Except that you can't mm -hmm. find it. You can't operate like that. Right? One of these days it's going to leak and a lot of record will go away in any case. So what happens is that a lot of data entries are still done by hand and they are sent by mail. Uh, so, you know, even the email is not being used and all. The data comes to the high court. Very little of it actually goes, very little of it is actually collated, cleaned up. And I'm telling you that it's aggregated in the first place in any case. It's not sufficiently disaggregated. So it's very mota, mota, broad kind of data. 
So first of all, we need to introduce additional categories of data collection, which we've done in the report, and then what kinds of tests to run. The problem with the data is that, first of all, there is this huge uh, sort of mystique and, and, and secrecy around it, right? So, and I can understand why, because individual case files, for example, have a certain sanctity, but that shouldn't be true for closed cases, right? Closed cases are closed cases. And that ought to be. The other thing is we collected this data in South of Punjab. So it's representative in some ways because these are, this is not Lahore, not that Lahore is very good. And we did something like almost 2000 case files. But I tell you one of the hardest things to do, and we were trying to create a sample which was very representative and there's no way in which you can do it because the data is not stored in that way, right? It was a huge task to be able to pull out those files and then to set several people to sit down and to decipher those files. So it's not easy. It's dusty work, it's hard work, uh, but it's eventually very fulfilling work. But the big problem was that despite the fact that we had permission from the highest level to do it, at every stage, somebody or the other would say, what, you are hmm. taking out case files? Uh, so there's this huge cultural thing uh, but now having done it, at least one can guide others who want to do it. So, you know, at least we, there's some, there's a learning curve here. Uh, we know where to look for it, what to look for, how to look for it. Uh, the rest depends on who can negotiate uh, a permission and is willing to then do the hard work. This is not for the Nambi Pambis. So anyone with a sense of entitlement should stay away. Anyone who wants to do hard work, there is a treasure cove out there. We'll get some students to do this. I'm reminded of the fact that you'll remember Naeem's, uh, Professor Naeem from Chicago was here. And uh, attitude towards data is such that he had to research Urdu novel, hardly a security issue in the Punjab <laughs> Public Library. And they wouldn't let him do it until we talked to the chief secretary. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a, our approach to say, data. I must say on the positive side, because yeah. we like to try and stay optimistic. On the positive yeah. side, we managed to do it, right? So we managed to do it because we did find some people in the court system who were yeah. dynamic yeah. enough to allow us to do it. So the report actually has data, which is seminal in the sense. Uh, and so if it has done, been, we have created a precedent, right? So others can also hopefully do it. But absolutely, I think we need to get involved, uh, get students involved. And we need collaborative arrangements between research institutes, universities, and the court. One thing which some of the judges started doing, which didn't quite take off, but which was useful, was the notion of judicial clerkship, where some of your smarter students actually clerk with judges, which happens elsewhere. You can have mechanisms to make sure that there are no ethical issues. But I can imagine that if I'm a judge, and I have the kind of workload I have, and I have two really smart law students working with me, I can really utilize their services. I can need all the hands on the deck which I can get. Huh. Clerks in the U.S. are the stars. I mean, they are the ones yes. who become the chief justices eventually. I mean, that's Precisely. a fact. I mean, who you have clerked true. with is one of the most important things on your CV. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, D, let's go to the floor. Shahid Mahmood. Assalamu alaikum. Can you everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, nice presentation, Osama and company. Uh, this was a very informative presentation and as somebody who has been uh, uh, to the courts uh, for the last five or six years for one for one reason or another, unfortunately, uh, this was quite an impressive presentation and quite, uh, and quite revealing statistics. Now, uh, I just have a few things to share. Uh, one of the things, although it was a wonderful presentation, uh, there are uh, there is one thing that I would like to discuss more. Maybe you, Osama, did discuss it, and the other participants, uh, other presenters did discuss it. But perhaps uh, my impression was that this wasn't t touched enough. Uh, this was about uh, this aspect. It is about how you choose a judge, especially the judges at the high court level. Now, my impression going to the courts for the last five or six years and talking to the lawyers and discussing with them is that. More often than not, now, since Osama also discussed that there should be, uh, his uh, impression was that there should be specialist judges uh, to whom the cases should go according to the nature of the cases. Now, the issue is, the, uh, the issue that comes here is the quality of judges. How are you picking the quality uh, judges, at, especially yeah, at the uh, high yeah, court level? Shahid Sahib, Shahid Sahib, we'll take it up next time when we are talking about judicial reform. This is really just about case law management. That we'll take up next time. 
okay 30th ko so we got okay. one on judicial reform na us pe tab okay karega. so uh, fine uh, let's just talk about case law management now i have encountered this problem again and again now as you've discussed it my only question is when will we our judiciary in fact who who is it is it the government is it the responsibility of the high court judges or the chief justice or the supreme court to really put this in a flow the system of because you know it as well as i do you have to go to the courts again and again requesting that my you have to file cms just for your case to case to be uh, heard right if you don't file a cm a civil miscellaneous application it won't be heard even for a year or two right so who is going to do it which party has the onus no so as as discussed i mean ultimately one would arrive one would like to arrive at some kind of a mechanism where all justice sector stakeholders have some say in judicial policy right you cannot have a system of justice where there is no meaningful policy level dialogue between the judiciary the police the government the prosecutors the jails the forensic people because uh, for criminal side and other counterparts elsewhere because i think at meta policy level uh, they need to listen to each other and all this decision making in terms of allocation of resources is ultimately a policy choice right we may not admit it but it is a policy choice having said that both uh, high court and the government have the leeway and the ability the legal ability to make amendments to procedure but as things stand uh, in terms of the deliverers of justice and in terms of the primary custodians what we've been saying is that it's the high court it's the high court's job to upgrade its internal administrative system in order to meet the huge requirements of a growing population growing dis- disputes and more sophisticated transactions and more complicated social issues and the system hasn't simply evolved the system if you look at all law reform commission reports you look at internal reports has been doing things they've been tinkering doing things incrementally some recommendations or a lot of the recommendations we are making are not new they have been there before i acknowledge that but what needs to be done is has to be done in a comprehensive structured fashion and now we have a precedent right i'm not a great sort of believer in transplanting things from abroad but this is something which is actually not context specific right the the legal disputes which people pursue and the kind of court structures you have lots of similarities and commonalities and when you look at east asia even cultural similarities so the point is that this has to be done by the courts i mean they have to take the leadership role that is the international experience they have to do it shakil durani sahab shakil sahab yes sir ji go ahead can i can hear you go ahead uh, uh, i thought this case management uh, the presentation uh, was useful Uh, especially this is one way of holding judges to account because right now judges particularly in the kachari level the district level no one is held to account it might take any any amount of time however i think uh, more than the rules and the processes and the procedures involved uh, it is the quality of the judge that makes a difference after all these were the same rules which were applicable before partition and i have seen the administration of justice reports in the frontier province the kp province in the th- 1930s and 34 35 and whatever and i realized that it was a very efficient judiciary now with the same law and the same rules and processes nothing appears to be happening and i think uh the the judges are to uh, be held responsible i'm talking again of the of the district level because i think the administration of justice at the kachari level is heavily tilted in favor of the accused in favor of the respondent the court staff and the lawyers and as far as the genuine plaintiff is concerned or the a uh, complainant is concerned no one seems to bother i'll just give you uh, time is short i've been a sub regional magistrate i've been uh, let's say a session judge in my capacity as a political agent in the tribal areas and i've held appellate 
position as the commissioner part of regulation in swat and malakand so i must have decided thousands of cases in, uh, in my life and i thought one of the main reasons for the delays is their adjournment liberal use of adjournments i never used to give an adjournment if there was a death in the family of the of someone okay seven days that's okay i've had lawyers tell me that they can't attend to my court today because the high court is in town swat for instance swat malakand or then they have something uh, in the sessions court i said do what you want to i'll come back i'll go and play my tennis and my golf and then assemble in my court at 6 pm but i want you here and i realized that not only uh, were uh, the very few requests for adjournments but if you were to look at the areas they really fell so i think uh, whereas case management is important what is more important and you said you are going to discuss it the next time is the quality of uh, of uh, of judges and uh, uh, grant of adjournments and i think uh, some work has been done by justice tasaddeq hussain jilani on alternate dispute resolution so important before you go for a civil case in particular you must go there i have so many other things to say but i'll just stop at that so Great, can i just show we we'll take up judicial we'll reform next time ji osama go ahead ji so a uh, very valid point about judicial appointments but uh, i think uh, the topic which is least discussed is judicial administration which is why we are highlighting it separately secondly the point you make about a germans is clearly and squarely a judicial administration problem if you look at the report for which the link has been given the data actually looked closely at a germans how they used who uses them what happens that's a classic and and very mainstream delay and court management issue and can only be resolved through that now one point slight point of um, maybe it's not a point of uh, departure or difference but a slightly different take uh, often times we are uh, you know this is said that we have had the same rules and you know it's the people who are different and we'll go into that next time but i think the rules are also obsolete we yeah. spent months excavating the rules which exist because these were the rules thrown at us we have so many rules so you go and look at those rules they are in a mess even as a judge if i wanted to implement them i don't wouldn't know where to start because there are notifications and then new ones come in and you don't know which one applies where to find them there are compendiums this thick you know that's not user friendly and secondly the international experience shows that even in england and a lot of other more developed sort of legal jurisdictions they have to go back to the drawing board just because the system was working earlier didn't mean that the same rules will uh, apply i mean they had all kinds of commissions set up in the 80s and the 90s and still it's a challenge and those commissions actually overhauled the the, the procedural and the administrative system of the courts in england we are talking here about things which we are still carrying on from the 19th century and let's also not forget society has changed the population has you know exploded the kinds of disputes have changed and people have found byways and all kinds of shortcuts which happens in any 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 system it's not peculiar to us so while i completely agree that if you have a good judge that sort of uh, you know that fantastical being which you're looking for and how do you find them and how do you train them that's a separate discussion uh, the framework itself is obsolete and i think one of the main findings of this report is that the framework also has to change and you then need to train those people in that framework there's no getting around that you get me 10 really smart judges tomorrow and you put them into this system and they'll turn into the same product which we have right now i can bet on that fair point fair point acha ji thank you very much i think we are coming to the end let me uh, turn to vakas sahab vakas sahab do you have anything else to say uh, zafar sahab john john usama right, the last vakas, one, before, to leave uh, a little while ago for okay zafar yeah. sahab do you have anything to say uh, actually i want to sum it up with uh, two things we need to follow up this subject with some other subjects which are this is kind of blue okay. uh, okay. my colleagues uh, they are aware of it and some of the participants uh, participants they raised very pertinent question with regard to delays 
and you know appointment of judges this white collared crime you know capacity building of the judges training of the judges training of the investigators the prosecutors the defenders and the judges themselves what is what is to be imparted at the judicial academy what is to be taught at the law schools what is to be done at the bar level so these are all very interesting subjects uh, it was a very interesting discussion i'm thankful to you uh spot on this was the subject which required this kind of discussion but this can trigger discussion on other other subjects as well looking forward to those discussions as well and i have shared a link where you can see there's these rules which have been notified and we have now rules for case management which have been notified by punjab government thank you thank you uh john do you want to say anything Uh, no? I think needs to John. You John, you unmute, unmute, please, unmute. John, you have Un to unmute. Unmute myself. Yes, no. I have unmuted myself. Yes, um, yes, very quickly. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I was slightly surprised, uh, Osama, when you um, said in your introductory statement that there was no uh, interprovincial dialogue on the subject. um because i do remember that while you were working uh in punjab on uh, your case for case management uh, piece uh the islamabad high court at some point published in the gazette a a draft uh case court case for management uh set of rules and this was intended as a survey to collect uh the opinion of of the public right and i thought that um well the idea of doing uh, you know such a uh, an initiative might have come from your own work in punjab and um we never heard uh, of any follow up to this survey carried out in islamabad but then i would have assumed that further to the publication of your of your um <laughs> we can't even call it the book and as zafar said quite rightly it's it's a piece of work that we all bow to um your um court case for management uh, report was uh, would trigger tremendous curiosity throughout the country and i recall that every judicial um you know uh, agency was provided with a copy and that the uh, positive feedback was overwhelming at the time so i would have expected that at some point the provinces uh while still of course remaining as independent as they want to be would have come together on such an issue as as case for management and there would be some peer pressure and some competition to to get there first so how come osama how would you account for the fact that there is no inter provincial dialogue on on the subject so the peer pressure drawn does work uh, in good ways as well i've seen that on the legislative front when one particular province takes the lead often times the other provinces also feel pressure to do so they also gain from that particular draft uh the case for management was something which people did show an interest in and i did speak to bishawar and islamabad myself my colleagues but what i'm pointing out is something not just uh, for case for management but a larger dialogue at a policy level between the high courts uh not only that which i think is missing because yes judges do know each other individually and they interact and all that but i don't think there is a very cohesive rigorous regular dialogue which is to discuss institutional predicaments and to find common solutions and to pool resources in all my experience and observation that's not there and secondly the kind of mechanisms and frameworks which have been set up for a similar dialogue at the provincial level between the institutions within the province uh police prosecution government jails judges that i think also is not there which is not to say that the government doesn't talk to them or at times these things don't take place but what i'm really talking about is regular rigorous meaningful policy engagements mutual learning uh, that forum is there and i think there are a whole host of reasons why that isn't there which has which are structural um which may come up in our next conversation Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, it has been a very interesting discussion. I've enjoyed it enormously. Um, it reaffirms.
the stuff that we find always that unfortunately we are hanging on to the colonial system without recognizing times have changed population has maybe grown 10 times and uh, cities have grown enormously international trade has grown enormously but we are still sitting with a feudal colonial system and we don't want to change the people at the center of that system are so powerful they enjoy themselves so much that they really don't want to change they have tons of protocol tons of power and i don't know how we can change them our job is mainly to try and create as much awareness as much consolidation of thought as much aggregation of thought as possible so that perhaps we can sometime in the far future create some as osama says some external pressure for change uh, the more we get together the more we discuss the more we talk that's how change happens that's how change happened elsewhere in the world that's how the renaissance happened that's how the reformation happened it was not one person or two people or one person writing a book it was thousands of them doing it so we'll continue to do it next week osama is going to help us arrange something on judicial reform which is a very very important subject again where we will take up all these issues of delays, of recruitment, of training, of all these issues. In fact, if we can break it up further, Osama, I'll talk to you. Maybe we can break it up further. It's too important a subject to have one discussion on. As you even case law management is too important a subject to have one discussion on. We want to keep these discussions of reform going for as many sessions as we can, maybe for a long time. Because ultimately, it's all about learning. It's all about once you learn, you create a constituency of change. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Osama, John, uh, Zafar Saab, Bakas Saab, I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. This has been a learning session. I will get some, PhD, some students to start some work on this. Osama, we'll pick your brain on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank, thank you, you for organizing.